plenary session uh, to decision making in Lemmin PCI. So actually, I'm very happy to have an excellent moderator, old friend Takash Akaska here, and Dr. Nakamura here, and as a panelist, Dr. Alkatri, Paul Cham, and Dr. Jun Chang, and Dr. Yun Go, Yun Zok, Dr. Patrick Lim, and Park Sang, uh, Yun Yong Hun. Okay, please. Thank you. All right, so um, you want to start the first talk uh, from the Michael Lee uh, from United States. Beyond the divide, weighing the post and con, uh, pro and cons and OPCI bypass surgery, the main disease, please. Great, thank you so much. Right now in the United States, it's Thanksgiving, but there's no place I'd rather be than here talking about left main and complex PCI. So it's thank you and again, uh, a pleasure and honor to be here. I was looking at the TCTMD website three days ago, and this is what I saw. And this is the Science Excellence uh, Top 10. And if you look at the top five, there's two Korean centers. At number five is Asan Medical Center. So Asan contributed a top five number of abstracts and scientific data I didn't to know TCT. That. So congratulations to the Asan Medical Center and the research team. So this is really fantastic. And as a Korean, I'm very proud that two of the top five are actually Korean. So uh, well done, Koreans. So there's probably no more controversial trial in the New England Journal of Medicine for uh, CAD other than the Excel trial. This is five-year data. And we all know about David Taggart, who is a contributor to uh, the Angioplasty Summit um, and a, a prominent surgeon. He actually recused himself from the author's list, saying that the results of the trial were different compared to the data and the observations. Mortality. There is approximately a 3% absolute difference in mortality in favor of bypass surgery. But if you exclude the patients that had non-cardiac deaths and just look at cardiovascular deaths, very similar. And this can be explained by infection and malignancy. What about stroke? Consistent with other studies, there's about a 1% absolute difference, usually at the time of surgery, and over time, this consistent, uh, uh, continues over time, does not converge. What about myocardial infarction? This is, again, a very controversial topic. And the concern was that perhaps you're combining both periprocedural myocardial infarction, which is biomarker-driven, uh, versus a spontaneous MI. But overall, at five-year follow-up, there's no difference in myocardial infarction. Now let's talk about ischemia-driven revascularization. Let's not talk about in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction, in which there are similar outcomes, but revascularization is actually not a clinical endpoint. It's a decision. So when you and your patient sit down together and talk about, should we do an angiogram, and should we do a PCI, or should we do medical therapy? So we could manipulate this. Again, not a hard clinical endpoint. In my opinion, it's a decision. Now. That was one study. If you combine the four trials that had five-year follow-up, and you look at Excel, pre-combat, Syntax, and Noble, I think it's fair to say that at five-year follow-up, we had 2,400 patients. There just simply is no difference in mortality. And if you do a Bayes analysis, maybe a 0.2% per year. So the reality is, at the end of the day, we are not doing harm. We're not causing increase in body bags for patients who have left main that go for PCI. What about stroke? This is, again, consistent with all the other data. About a 1% absolute difference in favor of PCI, mainly at the time of surgery. And repeat revascularization. Again, we're not talking about, left, let's say, left main disease, which requires revascularization. We're not sure if this was distal circumflex, a distal diag, but revascularization for elective patients, medical therapy provides just as good results. One thing that the trials did not take into consideration is patient autonomy. And it's the right of competent patients to make informed decisions about their own medical care. So if somebody has cancer and they're 90 and they're about to die, they could refuse chemotherapy. If they have left main disease, they have the option of listening to both the surgeon and interventionalist and making a decision. So let's talk about what patients want. In this study where they interviewed trialists and patients, Clearly, the hierarchy for what uh, physicians 
find the most important would be mortality. But look at here, look at patients. They actually find that stroke is more important than mortality. I have some patients that tell me, I'd rather die than have a stroke and be in a nursing home, have my diapers changed, etc. So we gotta think about what patients truly want. Now, another thing that we're excluded in clinical trials is clinical judgment. We all, as physicians, we're not robots, we make decisions. So we talk about what we think are most important. Well, if you have a complex left main, if you have low ejection fraction, if you have a calcified left main disease, and you're not facile with atherectomy or plaque modifying devices, what about diffuse disease, or if you have poor targets? If you have a great target, you're young, you have a CTO, I think cabbage is a great option, but if you're old, if you're in your octogenarian, and you have LV systolic dysfunction, and you, have a, uh, you live in a nursing home, you know, cabbage, in my opinion, is an investment. You're looking at 10, 20 year benefit, but if you can get through and go for a less invasive procedure, this may be a better option. Now, what are some factors and features that favor PCI? Well, if you have an osteo or mid shaft left main, it is very technically straightforward. The larger the left main, the better. If you have a four and a half, five millimeter left main, those lesions typically just do not reach the nose. Non-calcified left main is different from a calcified left main, at which point you have to do atherectomy, et cetera. What about single vessel? If you have a long diffuse disease, let's say in a typical uh, Anglo-Saxon compared to let's say a focal lesion in an Asian, East Asian, there are two completely different patients. If you can complete, uh, get complete revascularization, if you have no CTOs, you're not spending you know, six gray opening up a CTO, if you have a small circumflex where you could just stent right across, what about age? If you're old, cabbage, if you think about the benefits, 10, 20 years, you're probably going to out, the, the bypass surgery is going to be very beneficial for those younger patients, but maybe not those older patients. And frailty, it really takes a lot out of patients. If you're at a nursing home or you have a limited life expectancy, bypass surgery is not really a great option. Other considerations. I look at number needed to treat. Let's say there's a 5% absolute difference in repeat revascularization. So that means you have to treat 20 unnecessary patients with bypass surgery just so you could get one less revascularization. Personally, if I had left main disease and I saw that you have to do 20 extra unnecessary cabbages to prevent one repeat revascularization, I'm not sure if that's a road I want to go to. What about soft clinical endpoints? And this is what I'm talking about. After cabbage, higher chance of atrial fibrillation, you're gonna be on oral anticoagulation, you're gonna get hemothorax, Bill Clinton had a hemothorax, which required a two and a half hour surgery, infection, uh, time off of surgery, pain, discomfort, being in the ICU, you're constipated because you're getting oxycodone. I would ask any surgeons in this room, if you had a left main, you had a syntax score, let's say 25, which was the mean syntax score, and you had to choose between cabbage and PCI, I would say if you had cabbage, you're going to have to take at least three months off and think about time off from surgery, whereas if you had left main disease and you went PCI, you come in at five, get your procedure done at seven, maybe it's an hour and a half procedure, you get it radially, you walk off the table, you're home before lunch, you have lunch at home. And last but not least is choice of hospital and operator. I briefly mentioned this earlier about if you look at here at the XL trial, the only one predictor that stands out in terms of uh, a variable that favors PCI is a other location rather than North America and Europe. This is food for thought. This is small numbers, hypothesis generating, not hypothesis proving. This is one case where I use clinical judgment. This is an 85-year-old male. He had polio. He had a restrictive lung disease. And we did a viability study. And if you see here, just the LAD, the anterior wall is not moving. So there's not going to be a huge benefit for Lima to LAD. You can see the RCA has a CTO. It's well collateralized. EF is about 20%. Very frail. Uses a cane to walk. Cabbage for this patient is not going to be great because the Lima to LAD is not going to provide that long-term benefit. So in such patients where we use a mechanical circulatory support device, we support him. We do complex PCI, we do a, a, a crush, the distal left main. Here's your final angiographic result. The patient did great, went home the next day. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that at five years, there's just simply no difference in mortality for patients with intermediate or low-risk left main disease between cabbage and PCI. 
There is a higher rate of revascularization with PCI, but again, that is a choice. It's a choice between you and your patients, whether you want to treat it medically or with revascularization. And lower rates of soft clinical endpoints. Again, being on oral anticoagulation for AFib, pain, you've got pain where they um, uh, dissected out your saphenous vein, where they dissected out your radial artery. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. And let's move on to the next talk. Uh, let's, uh, next talk is entitled Choosing Wisely FFR versus Anatomy Dilemma in Left Main PCI and the Introduction to Fate Main Trial. This will be presented by Dr. Jiuming An. Please. Thank you, Dr. Kazaka. My topic is uh, FFR and anatomy uh, comparison in left main PCI, and I'd like to introduce the fate left main trial. Which is a significant stenosis? Actual left is a definitely significant left main stenosis. Right is definitely normal, almost normal coronary artery, uh, left main coronary artery disease. But the uh, large of gray zone in this kind of left main disease, is it significant or not significant? Actually, angiographically indetermined, actually. But uh, in random trial, how to define the significant left main disease? Two random trial, pre-combat trial <coughs> and XL trial, angiographic stenosis is the major determinant to, to decide the significant left main disease. Conventionally, more than 50% diameter stenosis was, has been considered as a significant left main disease based on the, the very early days of uh, the bypass surgery versus uh, medical treatment to comparison study, CAS trial, showed that some, one study showed that um, if left main stenosis, the diameter stenosis is more than 50%, medical treatment worse. The other study also showed that uh, comparison between the su surgery and medical treatment, if left main is more than 50%, uh, surgery is better, showed a better survival. But uh, in detail, uh, Dr. Takar, uh, Takaro, also the analyzed in detail that uh, they divided the diameter stenosis of field abdomen more than 70%, 50 to 70%, compared with the uh, 50 to 70% show the better survival in medical treated patient compared with the diameter stenosis, the, the more than 70%. If among the 70% of patient, if patient has had a very low risk profile, survival rate is very high, but the high risk profile, its survival rate is lower. The, this is non-invasive risk factors, history of congestive heart failure, chest pain and rest, cardiomegaly or ST change and rest. So it left to main diameter stenosis is uh, pronostically a kind of a spectrum. Mild disease, better outcome, significant disease, worse outcome. In addition, another study also showed that the, on a, uh, 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 this group, uh, another study also showed that the, compared with the 50 to 75 percent diameter stenosis, more than 75 percent diameter stenosis show that the worst outcomes, but uh, no heterogeneity according to the treatment effect between the medication and surgery. In this study, showed that the uh, tocile according to the risk of factors, low risk. Of, factor groups, medication, surgery is not better than the medication, but um, mild or high risk profiles, surgery is better than the medical treatment, even in the left main disease. How about the intermediate left main disease? Actually, the intermediate left main disease, 25% to 50%, actually mild or moderate left main stenosis. There is a very limited data this data from the ischemia trial, based on the CT analysis, showed that the mild intermediate diameter stenosis to 25 to the 50 percent, there is no impact on the outcomes, no difference between the medication and conservative treatment. However, we we already knew that the NG analysis is very has a very poor reproducibility. Very old data show that compared with the other location of coronary artery. The left main disease, some, some men, someone said that very significant, the other said that 
non-significant. Sometimes they read that the no significant disease. So angioanalysis for leptomania had a very poor reproducibility. So sometimes we need some uh, additional information. As you can expect that uh, this is a uh, leptomania disease predictor in ischemia trial, old age male sex, particularly the transient LV dilatation on after the stress or ST, mark the ST change in the treadmill test or poor mates in the treadmill test is associate, or, or associated with the left main disease. So ambiguous left main disease, actually this kind of non-invasive study that suggested a significant left main disease. Then which is the significant left main disease? Another question. Yeah, experienced uh, uh, cardiologist simply thought that the left is more significant than right. FFR is 0 0.71, the FFR is 0 0.89. I was sure that the left is a very diffuse disease from left main to LAD. <coughs> so theoretically, QCA cannot uh, differentiate the significant left main disease in, uh, in, very, uh, dif uh, in, in the status of very diffuse coronary artery disease. So right side, there is, it looks tight, but the lumen area is very big. This is uh, not round but elliptical, the left main, according to the projection, stenosis could be different. So in addition, compared with FFR, large of different, uh, and diameter stenosis, the large of the mismatches. Particularly for left main disease, even though the diameter stenosis is mild, FFR could be lower than our expectation because left main supply myocardium is larger than non-left main myocardium. So left main myocardium is, uh, left main FFR is frequently lower than 0 0.80, even though angiographically looks mild. In addition, other non-invasive functional study, thallium study, something like that, even though very severe triple vessel disease because of <coughs> balanced ischemia, the non-invasive functional study can be negative. In addition, treadmill test positive, even though the treadmill test cannot define the which region would be, would be the culprit for the treadmill test the positive region. If you measure the FFR, we can avoid the unnecessary left main procedure. So, however, we have to know that the limitation of left, left main FFR measurement, if there is a downstream disease, FFR could be the po false positive or a false negative. But even though the Bill Ferron nicely demonstrated that the downstream disease is not that significant, LAD FFR is uh, actually more than 0.5, left main FFR is not that different. So if left main, FF, LAD, left main to the LAD FFR is more than 0.85, the most real left main FFR is more than 0.80. In addition, the summarized of default lesion outcome based on the FFR show that the very, very favorable outcomes. In addition, FFR can be used to, to evaluate the circumflex ostium after simple crossover stenting. I will show you before. In addition, IFR can be used instead of FFR in the left main disease, but the overall number of study and patient is very limited. The 2018 ESC guidelines suggest that, that IVOS intracoronary imaging can be used, so anatomy can be used to determine the significant FFR value. I told you before, the less than 4.5 show that the very high positive predictive value, so if FFR left main minimal lumen area less than 4.5, you can, you can put the stand without any additional functional study. In addition, Western studies show that the predefined minimal lumen area criteria, six square millimeters, less than six, revascularization more than six deferred, the up to two years, no difference between the deferred region and revascularized region. But recently, very, there, here is very interesting data published that uh, even though minimal lumen area less than six, about the 40% of region FFR negative. But then minimal lumen area more than six, FFR positive is 22%, almost 30%. So minimal lumen area six square millimeter and FFR and IFR difference is about six to 70% huge. So which should be used to determine the significant left main disease? 
the physiology or anatomy. We have to define. Based on, the, this, based on the, this idea, huge difference between the anatomical evaluation and functional evaluation, we try to, uh, we, we plan the fate main trial. One arm, we, in, we will enroll the 900 patient, one arm evaluate, evaluate left main using FFR, the other arm evaluate left main using NGO, so we will see the one year clinical endpoint. So this is uh, uh, the final key message from the uh, DWFAC from the main PI of this trial. So fate to main trial, we assume that the improved outcomes with the FFR guided PCR likely a result of more judicious PCR, whereby ischemic producing left main disease are revascularized and non-ischemic producing left main disease are treated with the OMT alone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to the, the next uh, talk. Next talk will be uh, Hyun Cho Guon uh, from Samsung Medical Center. His talk entitled Be Provisional, Provisional Strategy for Left Main PCI. Please. Thank you. Thank you for a kind introduction. And uh, I'm very, very proud to be a part of the very important discussion uh, about Left Main PCI. I am uh, discussed about uh, the provisional approach, of course. So I think some of you are a big fan of uh, elective to stenting technique, but uh, I believe that most of you are agree that the provisional approach is a standard uh, strategy, and uh, even in the left main bifurcation. COVID through registry enrolling more than 800 patients of a left main bifurcation show that one stent strategy is better than two stand technique in terms of uh, target lesion failure. The, even after one year, the curve diverges further and the long-term outcome will be better uh, with the one stand technique. Recently, IRIS main registry was published from Asa Medical Center, enrolling 1,000 patients, showed a similar result, although not significantly different, but numerically, single stand was better. So this is the most important uh, trial comparing the provisional and systematic to stand technique for left main bifurcation. EBC main trial uh, showed that uh, the, in the EBC main trial, the side range stenting was performed in the 22% in the provisional group, 94% in the system to stand group. Initial one year um, uh, clinic outcome is quite comparable, but it's three years the curve diverges. The MACE was numerically lower, not significant, but the revascularization rate is significantly lower in stepwise provisional approach. It's quite contrary to DK Crush 5 trial show the two stand technique is better than provisional, but they compare the DK Crush as the elective stenting and provisional approach with a similar inclusion criteria. But I thought about the, this initial increase of event rate in the provisional group and the late increase of uh, uh, lesion failure here. This is caused by the initial rise of cardiac death or target vessel MI and the very late increase of target lesion revascularization, even though uh, they planned the angiography follow-up at 13 months and, and uh, the one month after the clinical follow, I doubt that the, the angiography follow really influenced the result. So this is not clear to me. And that's why the EBC guideline recommend the stepwise layer the provisional stenting as the preferred strategy to treat the coronary bifurcation lesions. Another recommendation from the EBC is that the two stent, two stent, uh, stent the most disease, uh, most disease the French first. If it, in the bifurcation, if you uh, see uh, more diseased, uh, uh, more disease in the circumflex rather than the, the uh, LAD, maybe the elective two stenting is a better strategy. This recommendation is based on this paper. So this is COVID registry, two stent technique, main vessel first versus the side branch first. We uh, found that very similar result in between two groups, but in a subgroup analysis showed that if the main vessel is more diseased, main vessel first strategy is favored. If uh, side branch is more diseased in terms of diamond stenosis and the lesion length, the uh, side branch first strategy 
is preferred. So uh, more severe uh, dis uh, lesion first strategies also uh, I believe that uh, this is true for left main bifurcation. And stepwise layer the provisional stenting, the proximal optimization technique part is very, very important. The EBC strongly recommended part as an essential part of the stent optimization. And part is more important in the left main bifurcation because site discrepancy of left main and LED is larger because circumflex is larger. It's frequently forgotten uh, in the, even in the live demonstration course. Actually, PAD is maybe more hemodynamically better than fine, uh, final kissing ballooning. In the, in the strain pattern, uh, hemodynamics are not improved after kissing ballooning, but improved after uh, proximal optimization. This is the hemodynamic result. That's why the final kissing ballooning is uh, that the result of a final kissing balloon is quite variable in these nine studies, including two randomized trials. One is from Nordic, uh, this is Neutron, one is from Assam Medical Center. <laughs> Actually, the result was worse for final kissing ballooning. So actually, strut opening is really matters after uh, left main stenting. It is not, actually. Uh, in COVID-3 registry, enrolled in 2,200 uh, patients treated with one stent technique, the strut opening leave alone strategy quite comparable in terms of TLF, even TLR. So it is true for left main even the numerically lower event rate in the simple crossover, crossover strategy. So are you afraid of a floating structure in circumflex ostium? And this uh, small study showed that, uh, the OCT follow-up study showed that the 95% of floating struts were fully covered after 12 months. So clinically okay, uh, imaging uh, basis is okay. So currently, a cross-COVID trial is underway in Korea, comparing cytokine stent treatment or not after members of stenting. But uh, still, I believe that we need a two-stent technique. I do that. I do two-stent technique. So what is the indication to treat the circumflex ostium? This is a smart strategy trial, and comparing the conservative criteria versus the aggressive criteria for ballooning and stenting of cytokine. When you are divided into a left main, non-left main, and left main, left main, the criteria was 75% in diabetes stenosis, 50% for balloon and stenting, aggress, 50%, 30%. Actually, initial one year, uh, the one year rate was uh, quite comparable between two groups, but uh, after one year, the curve diverges, and the three year significantly better with the conservative uh, treatment of a circumflex ostium. So we did it again for left main bifurcation. This is a small study, but uh, in Smart Strategy 2 trial, we show, uh, showed a similar result between two groups in terms of target lesion failure for one year. So in both in non-true bifurcation and true bifurcation, we are looking forward to a three-year follow. Okay, so how to treat this lesion? This is the left main bifurcation and two LED diagonal bifurcations. First thing I should do is uh, vessel size, uh, get the vessel size information based on the IVC examination. The left main, proximal, mid, and distal, we uh, found the vessel size based on the IVC examination. So final result was like this. It is a beautiful result with that I didn't lose, lose any uh, uh, branches. This is what I've done. Firstly, I implanted a 2.75 stent in the uh, mid LED and pull back the balloon with, uh, and dilate with high pressure. This is the first part. And stand another, uh, the more proximal, another stand uh, the proximally and pull back the balloon and part. And finally, 5-0 balloon was used for a part for the left main. The, I found uh, some compromise for circumflex ostium. Then I dilated the circumflex, finalized with the part without final kissing ballooning. We call it repart or final part. This is uh, following the EBC guideline. So in three bifurcation, I treated, treated the three bifurcations with the two stents, three balloons, no kiss, and four parts. And uh, you may have noticed that I did not wire, even wire two diagonals. 
this the beauty of uh, uh, tailored sequence of parts treating the uh, multiple uh, bifurcations, including left main bifurcation. So uh, this is a summary and conclusion. The stepwise layered provisional stenting is recommended as the preferred strategy to treat the left main coronary bifurcation. Proximal optimization technique is key to a stent optimization in the circumflex ostium open is not better than simple crossover in one stent technique. And uh, uh, most importantly, indication of circumflex treatment better to be conservative, the, even uh, you like uh, to stent technique. So very interestingly, bifurcation lesion may be the only, only lesion which is associated with a better outcome when treated conservatively. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gong. Very clear message. So next speaker will be a, uh, Professor Lam, very good friend of mine. So the title will be the Double Trouble, Double Success Upfront to Distant the Strategy of uh, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is my topic Double Trouble or Double Success for Upfront to Stand PCI in Left Main. It's a challenging topic, but interesting. What's the answer in your mind? I will share my one. For left main uh, bifurcation PCI, simple bifurcation, of course, keep it simple. But compared to left main bifurcation, you need to keep it individualized. Why? Because not all left main bifurcation lesion is fit for provisional. I show you a case you will understand. For example, like this case, there's critical distal left main lesion, the part burden in the proximal part is very heavy, the also shirt is tortuous and is heavily calcified. Of course, you can choose provisional, but the risk of culture of circumflex is very high. So what is my answer, double trouble or double success? If you choose provisional approach wrongly, then it will be double trouble. If you choose upfront to stand correctly, then it's double success. So uh, if you don't choose often to stand, but choose uh, provisional wrongly, you will encounter big trouble. The first trouble is uh, closure of shirt, and then you have to wire the shirt in a very stressful mode. Like this case, a uh, long story, it closed the shirt. And then you have to wire it in a very stressful mode. It's not that easy. Like this case, warehouse cannot do, filter XTA cannot do. Finally, we do it with uh, UB3, and in this scenario, uh, it's different, left main bifurcation is different from, uh, for example, AD diagonal. Many of the time when the shirt is closed, the patient has severe chest pain, screaming, and unstable hemodynamic. Like this case, patient struggle, and then we lose wire, lose everything again. And, um, and then we have to wire again uh, while the patient, you see the patient is moving, struggle, screaming, chest pain. It could be very stressful. He, once you experience that, you won't you won't want to experience the second time. Even you successfully wire save the patient, but the trouble is not the end. Then you will encounter the second trouble. If you choose provisionally wrongly, they stem from both us. If you look at the DK Quest 5 trial in detail, you will find that um, if you choose upfront to stand correctly, the stem from both way is just one case. However, if you uh, choose uh, provisional wrongly, then stem from both way is uh, high is totally six case, and all the six case are uh, fail provisional, and then they switch to uh, two stand. Uh, that is completely understandable because you can see you you have to wire the thread in a very stressful mode, and you won't optimize uh, control the same stroke like you do upfront two stand. So there will be more same from both us. So we can conclude that upfront two stand is must be better than two cents after failed provisional. And if you look at the three-year result, the difference between the stand from both us between these two groups is 10 times. Um, so uh, besides the two trouble, if you use, if you choose upfront two stand correctly, actually you can gain uh, two big success. First success is gain your experience. Like the case that I saw, uh, we do uh, upfront two stand, and in this case, I learned the wiring in this critical situation. I learned the standing approach, uh, kissing approach, and imaging. Um, don't look it down. It's very important because uh, I, if I ask you what is the most important factor for good outcome in left main PCI, use of IFS OCT 
No, DK quads or Coolog or provisional, no. Actually, in fact, from all the data, it's operator's experience. Uh, you do more often to stand, and then you gain more experience. You can see from the data, it's not different in terms of mace, it's different in terms of mortality. Um, like this paper uh, recently published, um, significant difference, not just a uh, 12 month mortality, in hospital mortality also major difference. And the data is completely reproducible. There's another paper published in Jack. You can see that in high volume operator compared with low volume operator, the difference in mortality is four times, 400%. So in your experience, that is the first uh, success. Uh, if you do a fun to stand in correctly in selected case, and you can also find experienced operator to portal you to do it correctly. And if you look at the Excel trial, look at the subgroup analysis in US, of course, favor say BG because they do less uh, PISA in, in, in Europe is neutral. In Asia, with the influence of TCDP and ASAN, we do more imaging guided and do more left main PCI. You see the, the outcome actually is favor PCI. And the second success is a bit controversial. It's cost reduction. And for us, upfront to stand is not that time consuming, but fail the provisional. You want to rewrite the threat, that is more time consuming. And many of the time, uh, unlike other bifurcation, it will involve unstable hemodynamic. Once we need to use MCS, and then uh, it could be very expensive. Also, prolong the CCU stay, and also uh, may fall up in half failure clinic and some potential legal issue. The cost is more than 100 stand. Uh, for one fail the case most of the time. And don't forget the increased stand from both sides. Uh, if you don't choose often to stand correctly, uh, choose provisional wrongly. Um, so the first success is um, if you choose often to stand correctly and you can perform it correctly, then you may have the potential to get the first success. That is full revaxization with low residual syntax. Uh, like this case, uh, uh, compass left main, we do uh, multiple stenting, uh, everything is fully revascularized. In fact, if for elective left main PCI, in, exper in experienced hand, the mortality is less than 1%. If you look at the DK uh, trial, the target lesion revascularization in three years is just 5%. That means 95% you get the chance to get full revascularization and with low residual syntax. Like this case, uh, follow-up in 12-month angiogram was completely fine. And after nine years already, the patient was made free, despite multiple standing. So, but um, you need to assess it correctly. Not all the left wing are uh, fit for provisional. At the same time, not all left wing bifurcation need upfront to stand. So how to assess is the key. Uh, you should assess the risk of third culture, significance of the search, capacity of the patient, and also com competence of the operator. Risk of the third culture is the most important. Uh, uh, you can use definition two trial as the background and then pastoral experience and gut feeling. IFAS and OCT can help, of course. And uh, the, my opinion, my remark is that first hole of upfront to standing is a spectrum. It varies with the lesion, the patient, and the operator. But one thing is very true, 90% of time, in general, is the third osseum that determine the strategy, provisional or to stand. Uh, LED is for the prognosis. So that is the end of my presentation. My conclusion is that one, why decision in upfront to stand left main PCI, you can avoid double trouble of provisional standing like short culture and increase stem from both way, and then enjoy the double success of upfront to standing. And if you can perform your double upfront, uh, double stand, two stand techniques correctly, then you may en enjoy the triple success. So that is the game experience, cost reduction, and full revascularization. Target lesion revascularization is just 5%. That's the end of my presentation. Great. Uh, it's really uh, you know, <laughs> interesting session. So, all right, uh, before the discussions, I'd uh, like to kind of a board, boarding force, right? So from the 
attendees, uh, do you want, if you have a main disease, true bifurcation, right? Uh, Medina 111, 011, anyway, true bifurcation. Do you want to do uh, provisional stance, Lajuan? Provisional stance. <laughs> All right, you can count on that. All right. <laughs> All right, what about the two stand from the upfront to two stand? All right. Maybe two, two more people <laughs> for the upfront to stand, right? Take the one, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. We're going to discuss uh, uh, freely from the panel, right? So, any subject, right? Okay. Are you gonna yeah, first of all, I need to say uh, about the problem of the circus area in the late phase. We are the criminal. Because 15 years ago, several people we reported about the resources of circus area. So this is the problem. That was the problem that we said. This is the first time maybe I think we discussed. So actually, but at that time, we don't we didn't recognize the two things. First, about the kissing, kissing, kissing stand. We do or we do not. And mm -hmm. second part is the. We, sh uh, we did not involve the idea of the physiology. Actually, maybe I think uh, currently we check the mm. physiology all the time in the late phase. Actually, currently our main strategy, of course, uh, uh, provision, actually the single stent is a much you know, high uh, proportion mm. of my strategy. But sometimes we, did, uh, we do the two stenting because our, our current idea is a uh, we should not hesitate to stand because the two stand uh, clinical results is quite nice. But uh, all the time we do the after the single stenting, we do not touch and then check even if we can see the some stenosis on the late phase, check physiology, physiology is okay, we leave it. Mm -hmm. So this is the current idea. But uh, anyway, previously we just uh, always uh, thinking of the angiographic result. So that's the reason why. All right. Michael? All right, so I want to uh, have a question. So you uh, mentioned uh, in terms of Excel study, uh, there are hard endpoint, mortality concerns, cardiovascular mortality, no difference at all, right? Do you agree that? And, and uh, there are some uh, higher frequency of uh, repeat revascularization and anyway, frequency of micro infarction. However, those kind of two endpoints could not transfer to the heart endpoint concern, right? Cardiovascular death, anyway, even in the five years concern. And so do you think the first thing is uh, ischemic driven TLR, uh, repeat revascularization, some, you know, spontaneous MI, is it really, what do you think, is it soft endpoint or, you know, sometimes a hard endpoint? In the setting, in the setting of acute MI, clearly revascularization is required. But in non-ACS patients, if you have a lesion in the circumflex or the LAD, I think an initial medical therapy is a reasonable option. So it, to me, in a non-ACS setting, re revascularization is a choice, a choice between the operator and the physician and referring physician and the patient. And that doesn't translate into a difference in mortality. So if there's no difference in mortality, then you're talking about quality of life. And if you could achieve the same quality of life with medical therapy, with guideline-directed medical therapy versus revascularization, I think there's, there's equipoise. Practically, do you explain that even, even Excel studies, uh, ischemic driven TRL is a little bit higher in PCI, something like that. In many PCI versus, you know, bypass surgery had read almost the same, you know, uh, phenomenon, so the meaning is, uh, even in the Excel, do you have some, you know, any information about the complete revascularization or incomplete revascularization in terms of a PCI arm? <laughs> would you, they got no idea about that one. So would you, would you explain that one? Yes. If you leave a patient with a residual physiologic stenosis in, let's say, an obtuse marginal, and you've completed the revascularization of the left main, and the patient has ongoing ischemia and angina, let's say three years post PCI, I think that it's a rigged system because there's no difference downstream in terms of mortality. 
Now, whether that causes us, you know, angina or not, I don't think it's a big difference. So long as there's dif no difference in MI and no difference in mortality, complete revascularization is subjective. It was not mandated to complete revascularization. You try to try your best, but everybody's coronary anatomy is different. So in summary, it is nice to complete revascularize the patient, but if you have residual disease, even if you had residual disease in the PCI arm, it did not translate into a mortality difference. I want to talk about the real data, even in the Excel study, even in the old syntax study, they could not define, you know, complete and incomplete vascularization in the PCI arm. The meaning is, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I think uh, is a future perspective, we need uh, some more, you know, uh, study in terms of idea uh, for the PCI arms, how to make a, you know, better something. Bypass surgery is better, basic concept, basic bias from the very old data from the bypass surgery versus medical treatment itself, right? Very recent data have some comparison, however, still, I think it's incomplete, you know, uh, pr uh, program, something like that. And so, uh, I personally, I think it's some uh, data more. So. See, complete revascularization is very mm -hmm. subjective. Mm -hmm. If you have a FFR positive distal LAD 0 0.80, and you don't treat it with PCI, mm -hmm. I think that's much different compared to a FFR of 0 0.60 in the prox LAD. So to have quote unquote complete revascularization, or if you have a residual stenosis in the second obtuse marginal, you, so it's very subjective. You got a clear, you know, contemporary uh, PCI concept and imaging, and, and I was, uh, sorry. thank you. All right, so I am going to finish it. Yeah, Dr. Kwon, you, I ask some question. Yeah, you, as I know, you, your group, your group is not uh, aggressive in you know, FFR measurement, right? All right, <laughs> so uh, you have to realize that FFR measurement is you know, guideline 1A, something, right? Yeah, sure. All right, <laughs> and second one, if you look at some FAME 2 study data you know, from the our data, more than half, at least more than half, more than 50% lesion in epicardial artery, more than half is negative FFR, right? And then, further, bifurcation lesion subset, more than 70% is negative FFR. But branch is concerned, right? Including the circumflex. There are many explanations in small, relatively small jeopardy areas, in a discrete narrowing, something like that. Anyway, more than half of the lesions is negative FFR. So I want to in your study, prospective future study, if you got some physiologic concept, mm. I think it's a little bit different, you know, uh, answer futures. Yeah, thank you for giving me a chance to uh, talk about that. I, I uh, like to have this talk uh, for 10 years, actually. I expected, but I, I didn't have a chance. The beauty of FFL is excluding the non physiologically non-significant lesion. F F I, I really believe that FFL more than 0 0.8 is not an indication of PCI or any revascularization because uh, physiologically not significant. I, what I don't believe is that lower than 0 0.8, 0 0.8 is ischemic. It's wrong. <laughs> if you look at the NEJM paper, first the, Dr. Piles suggested that they only, they, he only uh, proved that uh, 0 0.75, more than 0 0.75, there is uh, no ischemia. Lower than that, actually, even 0 0.6, 0 0.7, there is a discrepancy of uh, proving ischemia in the respect of a treadmill test. So, zero more than 0 0.8, okay, it's uh, not that ischemic. Lower than that. All right. Uh, really, I don't uh, want to discuss about the color <laughs> value of 0.8. So, if, if you give me a chance to uh, discuss it All right. in the future debate, I have a very uh, long uh, story about mm -hmm. what I don't believe in the FFL. It really tells the ischemia in our patient. Right. Uh, what I'm talking is, you know, you are significant lesion, right? Definition of a significance is by defined FFR. P 
visually 80 percent, even in the ischemia study. I agree with you. In that point, I agree with you. All right. So what I'm talking is even the side branch osteum, circumflex osteum is negative FFL is more than 70 percent. Maybe you remember that the Dr. Gu did a trial, the, the study right, comparing the FFL guided PCI versus the angiography guided PCI mm. for bifurcation. Okay. It was negative. Right. So because most of uh, we, that <laughs> final purpose is many physicians actually, you know, a certain rule, certain guideline, anyway, uh, based on the data, would, should be generalized, popularized. You know, and there's many physicians. Another point I'd like to add, tell you that it is that mm -hmm. uh, physiological uh, FFL guided PCI is not complete. F FFL, FFL is a 0 0.7 for circumflex osteum. The patient is very old. They, they don't like to walk, even walk. 0 0.7 is uh, fair to stand circumflex osteum. Very old lady, 0 0.7. That doesn't mean the ischemia. The, the lady cannot make ischemia. The, I have a one question, yes. uh, because the, Dr. Guan is in front of the mic in the bifurcation, especially in the left main, and uh, he emphasized the significance of the pot in the bifurcation region. Uh, typically, in the full part in the multiple bifurcation region, I'd like to ask that the part is important. Is there any clinically scientific evidence to prove it? We, we published the paper. R random data. We, uh, no random data. Random data. <laughs> we have discussed uh, about the random data. You don't data. have a random data. FFL guided PCI is better than No, what I mean is that this chemia. What I mean is that currently, uh, this year, the imaging guided uh, the versus angel guided in the bifurcation region was uh, the published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so in so the bifurcation analysis region. analysis showed that in the bifurcation, there was uh, no benefit. No, 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 no. October trial, which was done in the Europe, is a strong evidence. So in the bifurcation region, we have to emphasize the imaging. That is a class one. Yeah, in the bifurcation region. And uh, if you think about the part is important, you have to prove it in the clinical evidence. It's time. Yeah, I hope I a uh, junior colleague is to do that. All right. All right. <laughs> Fighting is always fun, you know? <laughs> it's good. Any 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 comment on that, man? Chair, I just want to say, I think Dr. Ho Lam's case was quite good on the, because if you look through, five, I mean, just trying to marry up two different um, um, concepts. One is angel guided definition criteria, and one is the what you proposed previously, or IVUS guided, and when you can think that the circumflex in, by imaging might not fit the criteria. Because I think on the case Dr. Ho Lam showed, it's a very short circumflex lesion. So by definition trial, it will be uh, simple. But I think if you image it, that might change. So I think, there's a lot of work to be done from all of us to see whether we can marry imaging and angel guidance to make it into a more formal way of finding when we can uh, choose uh, routinely uh, two stand versus one stand, I think. Uh, in my daily place, I have uh, two, uh, one stand or two stand for uh, lemon application. I check a, a three. Step uh, FFR to check uh, the uh, functional physiology, and uh, then I check uh, uh, IBUS for a uh, basal area size is okay because basal size is important for lemon bifurcation, uh, and uh, I check the uh, uh, basal anatomy. For one stand, the two stands, uh, uh, the procedure is different. So I check a three point uh, to help me help me to uh, decide a PCI for one stand or two stand. Uh, I have one question that's actually about uh, uh, already in the previous session the, uh, in, in we met we when we meet the left main bifurcation with the problem well, cross previous session yeah okay right yeah. Uh, I forgot that one <laughs> <laughs> cross of one stenting the left and circumference also is jailing the FFR is not significant mm -hmm. the what uh, the reason why the, the discrepancy between the anatomical and the FFR? The right. uh, main issue is a discrete narrowing, right? Non bunch prep after the stent crossover, some compromise of 80%, 90%, 
the flow is perfect. 0.86.9 something. So we don't need a treatment for that, right? So, all right, that's the uh, very key point for in terms of a functional concept. And so I would separate the non name main in our lab, don't touch. That is first rule in our, I think in our in the lab. And main bifurcation, circumflex is big enough, all right. Up front, the two stand would be, all right, better. Uh, we got some, you know, data about that. I like, I like to answer the Dr. Goh's uh, question. So, because the lesion is very short, the mostly coronal shift. Yeah, right. Coronal shift is functionally not so significant. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gang right. from Aston Medical Center okay. published a paper about that. All right. We, we got some uh, many data shift to, you know, discrete narrowing, short lesion. That is all the variables in terms of a negative FFR. Right? You know the FFR, what it yeah. is, right? Yeah. Negative FFR. Actually, I, I use FFR for the bifurcation sometimes. The all one right. thing I like to make it clear is that uh, there is uh, many uh, papers and pictures about the FFR and angiography diamond stones is not <laughs> correlated very well. Mm -hmm. It is not, a, not, not fair, actually. Okay. So if short lesion, long lesion, MLA, MLD is uh, the same, same two millimeter, 50%. Mm -hmm. FFL measures all the vessel. Angiography, mm -hmm. okay. I was only one point. This is not fair. Okay. FFL is guideline 1A. The meaning is for the patients, so we have to do at least good practice and avoid unnecessary procedure. There is our, you know, rule in our hospital. Okay. <laughs> One of uh, the <laughs> answer to the, the uh, Dr. Kohl's is uh, the, it is uh, the change of the shape. What I mean is that the, actually the vessels are, vessel morphology is uh, concentric before the, the stenting, mm -hmm. but the, after the stenting, it changes is uh, very eccentric. So, in some projection, it uh, looks like uh, very severe, but uh, the other projection is uh, quite. So when we do uh, the, in the, that case, is uh, the imaging area, lumen area, total right. area, even though right. eccentric, area is uh, spared. Right. That is uh, the one of the explanation. Okay, last one. All right, thank you. Oh, hi there, Bob Gerber from Australia. So in, in my previous life in uh, the UK, I was one of the defined flare investigators, as a few of you are here. And so I'm concerned about the use of FFR alone in the circumflex. We should be using non hyperemic methods, particularly in the circumflex. Remember that we don't measure the coronary sinus wedge pressure, and we also don't know that we get maximum hyperemia in that vascular bed. I did a case in Sydney last week the FFR and the LAD through the left main with a 50% lesion, 0.69. In the circumflex, 0.82. I then did an RFR with an RFR pullback from the circumflex. It's very significant. So we should be using the non-hyperemic methods. If you remember in Define Flare, which is the largest randomized trial in hemodynamics, IFR was equivalent, if not slightly superior, certainly in the LAD and in certain subsets, than FFR. So we're even going to do a randomized trial of FFR alone against anatomy. We should be doing RFR, IFR, or DFR. That's just a comment. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to yes, emphasize that we have to measure both because uh, FFR, if the region is discrete, separation may be the main cause of the, the pressure gradient, and diffuse region friction is the main cause, right? So the result should be different. Therefore, uh, when we try to measure the IFR or resting indices or uh, hyperemic indices, yes, correlation is good, but there are lots of scatter because the, the mechanism is different. Therefore, we need both, and if each uh, one, uh, either one is positive. That means the ischemia, I think. Dr. Ku, I, I found you, right? Do you agree? Okay. <laughs> okay, <right. Close. laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, hot discussion. Yeah. Uh, I would like to close this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>